Well, hello. I'm Stephanie Thulin. I'm the Assistant Chair of Kinetic Imaging, and I'm really excited to be here to introduce these guests, Pamela, Lorene, and um, Dr. Lehman. Um, this event is made possible with the help of our co-sponsors, the Department of Art History and the Department of Communication Arts, and is partially funded by a VCU Arts Inclusion and Fusion Grant. So thank you for all those um, entities for their support. And thank you to everyone in the audience for being here as well. Um, so Pamela and Lorraine are here today to discuss Funky Turns 40, a traveling exhibition that commemorates the 40th anniversaries of 1970s Saturday morning cartoons that featured positive black characters for the first time in television history. An exhibition that was on view at the new Black History Museum in Richmond this summer. And Dr. Lehman is here to discuss how black characters were portrayed prior to give us a bit of historical context. And please join us after this talk in the Fine Arts Building Gallery um, from 5 to 7 p.m. for the opening reception of a smaller panel exhibition of Funky Turns 40, which highlights the 21st from uh, the traveling exhibition. Pamela Loreen and Dr. Lehman will also be there to continue the conversation individually. And if you can't make the reception, the exhibition is on view until September 11th. I would like to start by reading the first couple of paragraphs from an article written in March 2014 in the New York Times. <clears throat> Growing up in the 1970s at opposite ends of New York State, two girls were immersed in all things cool, black, and funky. Saturday morning cartoons won their hearts. Lorraine Williamson in Rochester and Pamela Thomas in the Bronx would park themselves in front of the Jackson 5, uh, featuring a tiny Michael sporting a big afro and Josie and the Pussycats with the black tambourine playing Valerie Brown performing in a hip girl band. Eventually, the two met and bonded over their mutual interests. Not content to leave the funk or their past behind, Ms. Williamson and Ms. Thomas have amassed more than 300 pieces of black anim animation art from the 60s and 70s, which has become one of the world's most extensive collections in that field. In 2007, they created the Museum of Uncut Funk, an online showcase for original animation cells, posters, storyboards, and other objects celebrating black culture of the 1970s. And in 2014, Pamela and Lorene hit the road with the traveling museum exhibition, Funky Turns 40, Black Character Revolution, which featured 60 original animation cells and drawings. Again, from the New York Times, the exhibition represents the fruits of a struggle for a say in the representation of blacks in television images, among other rights, and the newfound ability of popular black entertainers to get such programming on the air based on their own appeal to a wide audience. The show offers a striking counterpoint to the previous portray stereotypical portrayals of blacks in mainstream media. Dr. Christopher Lehman is a professor of ethnic studies at St. Cloud State University in Minnesota and a former visiting fellow at Harvard University's WEB Dubai Institute for African and African American Research. He holds an MA in history and a doctorate in Afro-American studies from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Dr. Lehman is also here today to talk about his book, The Colored Cartoon, Black Representation in America Animated Short Films. This book was honored by the Association of College and Research Libraries as an outstanding academic title in 2008. In regards to the importance of Funky Turns 40, Dr. Lehman stated that it shows a time in American history when art and diversity and civil rights aspiration finally came together. Thank you. Um, and before I guess uh, start, before I hand the mic over to these three lovely people, um, we'd like to show uh, a quick background video, um, just to give you a little bit of context. It's about five minutes long. From 1900 to 1960, over 600 cartoon shorts featuring black characters were produced by some of Hollywood's greatest white animators in biggest film studios. 
These film shorts portrayed blacks in a racially derogatory and stereotypical manner as cannibals, coons, mammies, and step and fetch it characters with exaggerated features and ignorant dialect. In the 1950s, several of these racist cartoons were shown on television. As a result of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, the racial content of many of these cartoons was edited out or the cartoons were pulled from television altogether. Notably, the censored 11, a group of Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies cartoons were banned from broadcasts because they were deemed to be too offensive for contemporary audiences. In the case of the censored 11, racist things were so essential and so completely pervasive in the cartoons that no amount of selective editing could ever make them acceptable for distribution. After 60 years of negative cartoon images, it wasn't until the late 1960s, early 1970s that Saturday morning television cartoons started to feature image-affirming black animated characters with a modern look and positive storylines that delivered culturally relevant messages. For the first time, black children saw cartoon characters that looked, talked, and acted more realistically like them such as Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids, as well as more positive depictions of their favorite black music icons and sports heroes, like the Jackson Five, the Harlem Globetrotters, and Muhammad Ali in I Am The Greatest. For the first time, black children had cartoon role models who taught positive messages like family values, the importance of education, friendship, civic duty, personal responsibility, and sportsmanship. For the first time, cartoons like Josie and the Pussycats, Star Trek, and Kid Power featured strong female characters and multicultural casts. These cartoons not only changed the way that black kids saw themselves, but the way that white kids saw them as well. Also for the first time, black people like Barry Gordy led development of animated television programming featuring black characters from concept through to art creation and production. The 1970s revolution in how black animation characters were developed and portrayed in Hollywood represents historic change and the ultimate manifestation of Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. For the first time, characters of all races lived, played, and worked together as equals. Forty years later, the legacy of these revolutionary cartoons has eclipsed the stereotypical images that came before and have paved the way for a new generation of black animation like The Proud Family, Little Bill, Static Shock, Bill Moore, and Doc McStuffins. The black character revolution has come full circle with positive black animated characters driving box office receipts of animated feature films and sales of movie-based video games. Black characters have starred in seven of the top 10 highest grossing animated films and four of the top 10 highest grossing animated film franchises of all time. Ice Age, Madagascar, The Lion King, and Shrek. Queen Latifah, Chris Rock, Whoopi Goldberg, and Eddie Murphy portray positive animal characters with a black attitude, which is a significant departure from the negative black animal character portrayals of the previous century. Not surprisingly, 40 years later, the black character revolution generation would be the first to produce and elect the first black president of the United States. So please join me in welcoming Pamela Lorene and Dr. Lehman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Loreen Williamson. I'm Pamela Thomas. Uh, we are from the Museum of Uncut Funk, and uh, as referenced um, by Stephanie, um, our uh, exhibition that features animation from our collection, Funky Turns 40, is traveling to museums around the country. It was uh, recently at the Black History Museum in Richmond. Um, and it is now going on to another uh, college campus uh, down at FAMU in Tallahassee, Florida. 
Um, we'd like to thank Stephanie for bringing us here and bringing our exhibition here as well as everyone else. Uh, at VCU made it possible and we'd like to say thank you to all of you for coming and uh, hope that you know you've got great questions uh, we'll answer anything that you want to know um, but we're going to start out with talking to Dr. Chris Lehman someone that we've had the ability to uh, chat with over the phone and email with but until Stephanie kind of brought us together uh, we hadn't met him in person so we're excited uh, to be here with him today. Um, he is one of two people that has written a book um, on black animated characters prior to the 1960s. Um, there's not a lot of uh, study that's been done here, but he is you know, clearly basically the foremost expert um, who's out kind of talking about this stuff, so we're excited to have him. And we're going to start by asking him some questions in his book, Colored Cartoon, which I'm excited. I just got signed. Got my own signed copy. Um, and then, you know, Chris in turn will ask us some questions about, uh, you know, our favorite black animation characters in our exhibition. With that, Pamela's going to ask uh, Chris the first question. Uh, Dr. Lehman, I wanted to know what prompted you to write the book, it was my dissertation before it was my dissertation topic, it was something that my mother had actually suggested that I do. I was, I think, watching Tom and Jerry about 25 years ago or so, and it was a cartoon that I had grown up watching, and I was pretty familiar with the episodes by the time I was 16 or 17 years old. And for whatever reason, my mother walked in as I was watching Tom and Jerry, and most of the episodes, at least from the early years, 1940 to 52, had a heavy-set African-American woman who was the maid or the domestic servant of the house. She was never given a name in the cartoons themselves, especially because Tom and Jerry can't talk. But there is a scene when the Mammy character was in the film, and at some point there was an explosion, and Tom's face was blackened, and his lips were turned a sort of orangish red, and they took up maybe the bottom third of his face. And I had just thought it was a random explosion gag like a lot of cartoons back then had. But my mother, who was familiar with blackface caricature since she was from that particular generation, um, looked at that and turned to me and said, um, they're making fun of us, you know? And then she went on into the kitchen. But it was the way that she had said it so randomly and with authority that led me to wonder, how did I not see this? Especially after seeing this for so many years in my childhood. How could I have just thought that it was just a matter of charcoal or gunpowder being on someone's face. How did I not make an ethnic connection? And now that I see the ethnic connection, where else can I find it? And so my research started from there. Interesting. I didn't know that story. That's, that's a great story. I mean, we watched Tom and Jerry, and I think the thing that was so interesting about Mammy, and not necessarily making all of the ethnic connection, but, you know, understanding that you never really saw her face. You know, it's basically, you know, kind of the domestic outfit and slippers. Right. You know, house slippers. And, you know, she would kind of come in and come out, and it's just, it, you know, as a kid, you're like, okay, that's weird. She doesn't have a face. Uh -huh. But it's a cartoon, so you don't, you know, again, say, hey, you know, that's making a statement. You know, there's a black woman featured in this cartoon, and she's not fully human, right? She's, you know, they've kind of taken her ability to express and, you know, kind of show humanity away. And she's just kind of an object that's kind of a prop that kind of plays off of Tom and Jerry. So um, it's just fascinating that that was kind of the cartoon that, that prompted you to kind of move forward with your book. Right, and Jack Zander talked about that. He was one of the animators for Tom and Jerry and a bunch of other films. And he specifically says in, in the colored cartoon book that... The directors of the film, Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera, later forming their own studio, did that on purpose. And Jack Zander felt that Hanna and Barbera didn't want to give the Mammy a personality because Tom and Jerry were the stars of the film. So 
That's why you see all of Tom's body and Jerry's body, but you don't see the mammy's face. Why, why do you think there was so little research done on this particular topic? I think there's a lot of sensitivity that people in the animation industry had by the time the civil rights movement is over. When I was doing my research for my dissertation, what I tried to do was contact as many animators who were still alive as possible who had made those films from the 30s, 40s, 40s and 50s. And what I found was that more often it was the animators who'd be willing to talk to me, but the directors would not. I received a polite no from Chuck Jones and from Frizz Freeling, but quite a few of their animators and animators from other studios were more than willing to reach out to me because animators generally don't get into the animation history books, the directors do. And they were very candid and very open to sharing whatever it is that they had to share. What they were worried about though, this is a sensitivity part, is that I would call them racist or I would call their work racist. And I went out of my way to promise them, you know, I'm not going to do that. I might talk about the stereotypes that are in the films because they're there. But if you're worried about the word racist, um, I'm not going to do that. And then they were like, okay, well, this is what I know. Ironically, Jack Zander was the one who called Hanna-Barbera racist. So I guess it depended on which animator was more sensitive to that than others. Interesting. Um, so you found some folks that were receptive to talking to you. Um, what did you expect to kind of hear them say? And, you know, what insights did you learn from them? And was there anything that they told you that was surprising, that was kind of unexpected? Well, I expected animators to be defensive of their work because nobody likes to be criticized for their art necessarily. And I expected them to say, well, that was back then, those were the times, times were different, humor was different. I didn't expect the people who were candid to be candid about their work, like Jack Sander. And another thing that was surprising to me was that there were animators who talked about the characters that they drew as expressions of fondness or people who were fans of the people they were caricaturing. For example, I talked to Bernie Wolf, who had been an animator for Max Fleischer, and he was one of the people who animated the Betty Boop cartoons and the Popeye cartoons of the 30s. And a couple of the Betty Boop cartoons have caricatures that are actually voiced by Cab Calloway and Louis Armstrong. And what Bernie told me was that he really enjoyed Cab Calloway's music, and so he jumped at the chance to animate a character that was voiced by Calloway. And the clip that you saw had a brief picture of the film Cole Black and the Seven Dwarfs, which is essentially a blackface World War II set spoof of Disney's movie. And what Clampett wanted to do at the Warner Brothers studio was to make a film as anti-Disney as possible. And if you compare the soundtrack for Snow White versus the soundtrack for Cole Black, it, the music's as different as night and day. And of course the characters are because the Snow White cast is white and the Cole Black cast is black. And Clampett made sure that he hired African-American vocal artists to voice the characters. There was an African-American musician who scored the film. It wasn't the usual music director called Carl Stalling, it was somebody else. Now, there were still some stereotypes in the film. For example, Prince Charming has a pair of dice for his front teeth, and of course everybody's big-lipped and so forth. But Clampett genuinely felt admiration for the jazz music and the jazz artists that he was depicting in the film. And he didn't see anything wrong necessarily with what he did. And of course the entertainers didn't either, or else they wouldn't have agreed to lend their voices to the film. What is your um, assessment of the portrayals of black people in these animated shorts? Do you think mm -hmm. the, the characters were racist, the way that they were being portrayed? Well, I, I definitely think that 
they come from a place of exclusion. I mean, the animation industry was a very non-black industry. It was full of European Americans, whether they were Americans who had been in the country a long time or whether they were immigrants or the children of immigrants, which was the case for a lot of East Coast animators out in New York. But um, African Americans just were not animators before roughly 1955, 56. Not only that, but going to the movies and seeing cartoons was largely a European American experience. During the days of segregation, especially in southern states, there were theaters that either had African Americans sit in the balcony while European Americans sat on the main floor, or African Americans just were not allowed into the theaters at all. And when it came to showing cartoons all morning on Saturdays, these cartoon shows were only for European American children. Now there's one theater in North Carolina where if African American domestic servants brought the white kids of the white um, household that they worked for to the matinee, then the white kids could sit in the main floor of the matinee, but all the maids had to sit in the balcony and sit through the matinee, then go down and get the kid when the matinee's over. And at these matinees, not only do you see cartoons, but you also get prizes. So you can get a free bag of candy or a free bag of peanuts just for being white and being a kid and showing up to the theater. And so it conditioned children that there's something special about not being black and getting to go to see Mickey Mouse or Popeye and get free stuff while you do it. And I'm still in the process of trying to study what that means for both white and black kids who grew up before the 1960s. Interesting. Um, so, I mean, from, from your perspective, because there's a lot of debate, you know, on, on, again, was it just a reflection of the times? You know, were, you know, was Disney, you know, like an evil racist studio? Or were they, you know, I mean, I, I'm interested to kind of get your perspective on it, because clearly when you talk to the animators, uh -huh. you know, you came from you know, probably a very neutral you know, kind of point of view and kind of let them explain, you know, kind of how they, they did their, uh -huh. their work and kind of what the, the feeling was. But, I mean, did, did you walk away with a, a sense that, you know, there were some studios that were worse than others, had worse betrayals than others, were doing things more kind of purposely to send, you know, some type of a message? Or was it truly just this was just, they, they kind of, you know, made fun of everybody? and it wasn't anything that was particularly targeted to African Americans. Well, it depended on where the studio was because among the East Coast animators who were immigrants and children of immigrants, there was a lot of sensitivity that they had to being new to America and part of the camaraderie of working in a New York animation factory was everybody making fun of each other for being Italian or being Jewish and making fun of their accents. Sometimes, or a lot of times, that would just spill out into the films. And you'd find this especially with Max Fleischer's films. Disney is different because Disney started his studio in Kansas City, Missouri. And Missouri was a segregated state back then. So that meant that anyone who came out of art school to be hired at Disney studio came out of an all-white school. So there were no African-American animators in the labor pool for Disney to hire. And I think Disney premiered his very first cartoon at the Newman Theater in Kansas City. And the Newman was a theater that had a segregated balcony for African-Americans. And so Disney is a product of this environment and Disney's friends and coworkers, some of whom later started their own studios, are also from this environment. And they are exposed to some of the worst violence that happened to African Americans in Kansas City 
it was very common for African-American houses to be bombed. And a couple of the houses that were bombed in the late 19-teens, when Disney and his friends were teenagers, were very close to where those people lived. Now, they were in the same neighborhoods, but they might be one or two miles away from where an explosion was, so they could hear that. So, and Jim Crow is definitely part of Disney's experience and the experience of his friends before they even start making films. But when they start making films, then Jim Crow goes into how the films are distributed and who gets hired to make those films. And the same thing happens to Max Fleischer when he leaves New York and moves to Florida. The segregation there is just as deep, and Max is not able to hire any African Americans because there are no professional African American artists in Florida. And some of the animators even begin to soak up the culture, if you will. They might not have employed African-American maids in their homes back in New York, but when they went to Florida, they did. And it was just part of the environment. You couldn't help but get sucked up in it. When Max made a couple of movies at Miami Beach, no African-Americans were allowed at theaters. So when the movies premiered, only white people saw the cartoons. Now, I don't know if Fleischer wanted it that way or not, but under Jim Crow, that's just what happened. Um, there's a, a, a group of cartoons that has been called the, the Censored 11. Eleven. And um, I've seen them. I don't know if anyone in the audience is familiar with them. I know you are familiar with them. Do you think those cartoons should be permanently banned? Although they're banned, there are, are ways for individuals to get copies of them. But do you think they should be banned permanently, or do you think they should be made readily available for the general public to see? Well, I think that they shouldn't be banned entirely, but they should not be marketed to children. I think the best way to view those kinds of films would be in some kind of collection that has some kind of disclaimer or some kind of lecture even about the historical context of the films and some of the things that I had mentioned earlier, like the segregation in the industry and the segregation in the country as well, that informed why certain films have certain images. And then after that, go ahead and show the films. But I wouldn't have those films appear on a channel like Nick Jr. or anything else that specifically targets children, especially if children are just plopped in front of the TV or plopped in front of a laptop where they have YouTube and watch those films without any kind of context and without any kind of um, explanation from an informed adult. Yeah, in reading your book, I certainly got the understanding that, um, that the, really the start of kind of the vintage animation industry, from your perspective, was really kind of based on black culture. They took different aspects and, you know, forming the characters and the music and things like that. Um, so it's really one of the earliest forms of kind of cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. Could you talk to that a little bit? And also, you know, if there's any parallels you can make to kind of what's seen as cultural appropriation today, mm -hmm. you know, if it's similar, if it's different, okay. and, you know, specifically kind of how it got started uh, in the animation industry. Well, it started out as very practical at first. Animation used to consist of animators drawing a character in its entirety on sheet after sheet after sheet. And if you have to mass produce films, you don't want to spend a whole lot of time drawing details and trying to get each detail exactly right from sheet to sheet. So what you do is you draw a character that's completely jet black in its body and you make the character's face easier to animate by making the eyes big 
and making the mouth big and making both the eyes and the mouth white. Now that happened to look like drawings of characters in blackface or what passed for caricature of African Americans back then. And some animators just went with that and made black characters that look similar to the different animals like mice and cats that they were making at the same time. For example, there was a character in the clip who was definitely a, an African-American boy and looked just like Mickey Mouse, except he didn't have any ears. And that character's name is Bosco. He was the first character to come out of Warner Brothers in the Looney Tunes series. And the Bosco character was actually made by Disney's friends, Hugh Harmon and Rudolph Ising, who are like Disney from Kansas City, Missouri. And they used to work for Disney's studio, but they left and I think they left just before Walt Disney created Mickey Mouse, so they missed out on all that. But they essentially made a Mickey Mouse clone with their Bosco character. What do you think it, um, why do you think the studios were forced to ban the cartoons? And why do you think they, well, what do you think they were forced to ban them? Was it so much for the content or was it backlash that they were getting at the time? if there was backlash? Well, there was some backlash at first. I think by 1948, 1949, there's a letter writing campaign that the NAACP starts and that the African American newspaper Pittsburgh Courier starts. And they don't get a whole lot of cartoons withdrawn from theaters. I think they only get maybe one or two banned. But Ultimately, the studios get the message that making these kinds of films creates a lot of unwanted publicity and it might be to the, det the detriment of the company if we invest all this money into a film and then we don't get any income from it because we have to pull it out of the theaters. But what really happens is television comes along and it's the television networks that are even more skittish than the movie theaters about the problematic images. The NAACP had made a campaign against a live action comedy show, Amos and Andy, because of its stereotyped imagery. And within two years of the protest, the CBS network pulled it. And television networks were very cautious from that point onward. So whatever a cartoon studio said, now, I have all these old theater cartoons. Do you want to put them on TV? Networks would say, yeah, but cut all the black stuff. If you have any blackface stuff or people singing jazz or speaking silly dialect, just cut it out. We don't want it. So it was the television networks that really democratized animation. But in the 1950s and 60s, what you had were a lot of old censored cartoons from long ago. What you did not have were new positive images to replace them until 1969, 1970. This brings us to kind of where we've come into this. Um, as children who grew up during the 1970s and saw these cartoons and just assumed that these cartoons had always been like this, with, you know, Fat Albert and the Jackson Five and you can see the Harlem Globetrotters and you know, black people uh, working with white characters and different cultures of characters, um, you know, as equals, you know, getting together to solve mysteries or solve problems. So we just assumed that that was always the way it had been. Um, I think that, that I had seen some of the edited cartoons before that, but not, not that much, not enough, other than Tom and Jerry probably was the one that I saw the most. And, you know, I don't know, Pamela, if you saw a number well, of them. I can't say how many I, I have seen, but I do remember, you know, as a child, sitting on the couch with my grandmother watching uh, those cartoons and not really fully understanding what was taking place in them, but I knew what I saw didn't feel good to me inside. Um, 
So when the 1970s came along and you started seeing, you know, these characters who were doing some amazing things and they weren't the step and fetch it type characters, you know, it was a pretty amazing time for a kid such as myself to see a reflection of myself in a positive format in a cartoon. And it's interesting because at that time you had, you know, more positive representations on television and in film as well. So there was an explosion, you know, a revolution of more positive uh, black characters. You know, some 40 years later, you can have a conversation as to whether some of those images were stereotypical, but certainly they weren't nearly as offensive as what had had occurred before. But again, to a kid, you know, it was great. You sat down every Saturday, watched your cartoons, went to school, sat down with your white friends, with your Hispanic friends, talked about what you saw on Saturday. It wasn't, it just never occurred. Even as I started to collect animation, Pamela started to collect the animation, that there was anything more than, gee, this is cool stuff that we liked as a kid. You know, it's gonna make you know, interesting stuff to kind of put on the wall. And then as we started to do a little bit more research, we, you know, realized, wow, this was a, a significant departure from what um, had been presented uh, prior to that as film shorts as we came into television. Um, one of the key things clearly that happened was the civil rights movement and, you know, kind of the, the positive representation of animation characters is uh, one of the positive results of that, you know, through television, but also pressure through NAACP and other people uh, that kind of brought these things to bear. Because, it, you know, it's one thing to kind of remove negative images. It's another thing to actually start creating positive black images and letting people like, you know, Barry Gordy and, you know, to, irrespective of what you might feel about Bill Cosby, he was very instrumental in bringing positive black characters to television. Then you had, you know, uh, positive representations like Lieutenant Uhura, who had not only broken, you know, kind of some color barriers from a television perspective in Star Trek, but then she came over to, you know, animated cartoons. And there was a lot of, of you know, kind of groundbreaking going on. So, you know, as we kind of come out of the 60s into the 70s, um, and in you know, the effort to kind of keep us on time and move us along, um, you know, we'll start to talk a little bit about those cartoons. I'd love to get your impression of what you think. I mean, clearly we love them, we collect them, and we, you know, have a very strong opinion that they were significantly better um, than what had come before and, you know, left such a lasting impression on us as kids that we've grown up to kind of, you know, build this interesting collection and, you know, create an exhibition built around it. But again, kind of from a historical perspective as somebody who really, you know, understood how the, you know, the, the film shorts were constructed and kind of the backgrounds behind them. I mean, what did you think of, you know, kind of the decade of, of 70s cartoons and black character representations in those cartoons? Well, looking at them from a historical standpoint, I'm impressed by what the networks were willing to put on the screen in 1970 and 71, even 72, because the Civil Rights Act is only passed in 1964, and there isn't a regular African American in a role on television that doesn't have anything to do with a servant until Bill Cosby and I Spy in 1966. And then for women, it's the same with um, Michelle Nichols in Star Trek that same year. But you still couldn't have people of different skin colors, especially men and women, together in the same scene and have them even touch. There was a special with the singer Petula Clark in 1967 or 68, and she was a British singer, and the African-American singer slash civil rights activist, Harry Belafonte, during their duet together, put his hand on their shoulder, on her, on her shoulder, and people called in and had a fit that this man put his hand on this woman. Um, ultimately, it was much ado about nothing, but the controversy that it had caused at the time that it aired was pretty significant. So you have in 1970, just two or three years later, a show like the Harlem Globetrotter, <clears throat> Globetrotters come on CBS Saturday mornings, and the cast is caricatures of the Harlem Globetrotters basketball team, the actual athletes, but who are voiced by actors. 
a Scooby-Doo clone dog named Dribbles, and the driver of the bus is an elderly white woman. Her name is Granny. And to have a white woman share space with black men, and a lot of black men, and not only that, but for them to be enclosed in a bus together and drive all over the country, um, that would have been unheard of on TV in 1970. And for it to be in a cartoon, no less, was really significant. And I think what made the shows like Harlem Globetrotters and Jackson 5 and Fat Albert come on the air was that they were all established properties. Studios might have wanted to figure out what to do about bringing black people to cartoons, but since they didn't have a whole lot of black people in their studios, they didn't really know how to do it from scratch, so they licensed all these entities, Hong Globe Charters being one of them. But they were aware that they had to be really careful in how they brought them to life through animation. And in my first book, which is about cartoons made during the Vietnam War, I actually have a quote from one of the Hanna-Barbera employees who wrote the episodes. His name was Ken Spears. And what he said about the Harlem Globetrotters was, all we were concerned about was making a funny show. We did treat everything on the show with the utmost degree of respect. This respect involved developing characters and manners reflecting the social gains made by African Americans as of 1970, instead of harkening back to the caricatures of the 1950s. There are things we cannot do, Spears remembered an African American couple monitoring the episodes, saying. We can't stereotype the ways that blacks are supposed to sound like. Let the actors be themselves and do not encourage them to sound too ethnic. So Spears was recalling that he had actually hired a black man-woman team to counsel the writers about how to write for these black characters. And they're cautioning Spears to not be stereotyped in how they make the characters talk, which was a big deal. He, it's one of the complaints that the Amos and Andy actors had was that you had white writers who were telling black actors how black people should talk. And that really rankled with them. 